Welcome. This is Dr. Morton. Uh, so this is class day 17. Uh, on class day 16, we did the lecture in person uh, uh, on Wednesday at 2 p.m. And uh, I covered the test and I hopefully have given everybody that was there uh, the extra points. Remember, uh, I don't average those in. I do change your score. Uh, and uh, whatever averaging you might be doing on Blackboard doesn't really mean anything because everything's put down into a spreadsheet. I weight it according to the syllabus and then I roll it up. So, um, yeah. All right. So, uh, um, yeah. So here's the syllabus. Um, and let's see, maybe blow it up a little bit. So we're, um, this is the uh, last day of September. That's amazing, right? We're pretty much uh, running out of September. And uh, we'll soon be in October, starting tomorrow. And um, remember, tomorrow, Saturday, October the 1st, you've got two quizzes due, Chapter 7 and Chapter 8 quiz. Be sure and do both quizzes. Um, OK. And then, um, yeah. And then um, uh, homework's due on Monday for Chapter 7. Um, and Chapter 8 homework's due on Wednesday next week. Okay, um, what we're going to cover today is uh, uh, the, we're going to cover some combinational devices, multiplexers, read-only memories, decoders, and adders, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get through all that. Um, I'll probably only touch on the adders a little bit. Uh, we may come back and spend a little more time on that. We did talk about that on the first test. Uh, we did the four-bit adder on the first test, so I, I'll spend a little less time on that or maybe, maybe not even talk about that. Okay, let me... Um, let, let me uh, then so here's the uh, here's the book now the first thing uh, so this is chapter 8 and notice we're going to talk about ROMs decoders multiplexers uh, an adder and I think we also threw in an uh, exclusive R even though we've already talked about that a little bit too alright these are the learning objectives this is all covered in this uh, uh, video that's uh, here in the chapter you should definitely look at this video. Uh, either pause this now and look at this video or come back and look at this video later. But you should definitely cover this video. And what I'm going to cover uh, in this lecture will just reinforce a lot of what's in the video. And I think you'll find that the, this video really does cover the chapter. So pretty much what I'm going to do today is just reinforce some of these things and uh, work a few problems with them. Um, all right. Uh, so again, the combinational devices are pretty much up here in the glossary. The multiplexer, the read-only memory, uh, the decoder, the adder, and the XR. Um, okay, and you can see the again the 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 video the chapter video pretty much covers all this. So I'm not going to repeat that. All right. So what I will do is I want to um, so I, I just want to highlight some features. So first off. Uh, and, and I cover some of this in the in the video as well um, but uh, so first off uh, we're going to cover we're going to cover multiplexers we're going to cover uh, uh, decoders we're going to cover ROMs and uh, I, I probably won't talk much about adders because the video covers that pretty well but I'm going to mention it and then finally, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, exclusive OR gates. All right, let me start with the last one first. So we write exclusive OR gates. We put a double, a double circle, and then we do an OR gate. And if we have three inputs, what's important to remember, say if we do ABC and the output F. So if we do a truth table, ABC, oops, can't see that. <coughs> Excuse me. We have ABC and then the output F. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Oops, sorry, these are ones. And then zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So this is uh, one, one, zero, and this is one, one, one. All right, and then 
So if our output f. So wherever you have all zeros, we have a zero. Wherever we have a single one, we definitely have a one. Where we have two ones, we have a zero. So there's a single one. Here's two ones, two ones. And then where we have three ones, what do you think? Well, it turns out we put a one. Now, it's a little confusing when you use the term exclusive OR gate. Uh, at least it's confusing to me. But that is, that is how we do it. And uh, so you just have to remember that. Um, if we had four inputs, uh, anywhere you had four inputs, we'd put a zero. But th anywhere you had three inputs, you'd put a one. Anywhere you had two inputs, you'd put a zero. Anywhere you had one input, you'd put a one. And anywhere you had all zeros, you'd put a zero. All right, so that pretty much covers the exclusive OR gate. And you can do a lot with exclusive, exclusive OR gates. Uh, but we're, we're not going to really spend a lot of time on XOR gates uh, in, in this course. And if you put an inverter on the output, then we call it an XNOR gate. Exclusive NOR, because it's a not exclusive OR gate. And sometimes we call that an equivalence gate. Equivalence gate. All right. OK, so that, that takes care of that. So now we're going to talk about, uh, let me first uh, kind of add some information for multiplexers. OK, uh, so we do multiplexers. We draw them. We draw. We draw them in this little trapezoid, and the, this is the output. We'll call it F. And then, say if we have a four to one, then we have four inputs, and we have to have two control lines. And we'll call them A and B. But oftentimes they go by cell, cell uh, one and cell underscore zero, or they might be cell one and two, or they might be cell A and B. One of them is the higher order control line, and one of them is the low order. And if we have I0, I1, I2, and I3, what happens is these control lines select for one of these, one of these inputs, and it connects it to the F. Now, it connects it in a digital way, so that F is always F either equals 1 or 0 and nothing in between. Except, of course, when it's transitioning, and then for a brief instant it's between those two, but it doesn't take long. And, and we don't ever really want it to think about F being anything other than zeros or ones. All right? And so that makes it a digital multiplexer. We also have analog multiplexers. Most of our, almost all of our embedded controllers have analog multiplexers of one kind or another for various parts. Uh, if we have an analog to digital converter, usually we have several different input pins we can connect to it, and we use an analog uh, multiplexer to select which pin. And in an analog multiplexer, unlike a digital multiplexer, say if our inputs could vary from 0 to 5 volts, then the F would vary from 0 to 5 volts. It would transmit theoretically, the exact signal would transmit in. And uh, since they're solid state devices, there may be a little bit of, uh, there may be a little bit of uh, loss in the transition, but, but they're pretty good. They don't, they're not very lossy, and they give you a pretty faithful uh, analog connection. So F can be anything between, say, 0 and 5, or if it's designed to work at 3.3 volts, then it might be 0 to 3.3, or whatever. And uh, in our microprocessors, they pretty much run from our whatever we're running. We run the chip at ground for uh, our VSS, and then our VDD can be maybe 3.3 volts, 3 volts, 1.8, 5 volts, maybe even 5.1, 5.2, something like that. Uh, but we usually we don't go much over 5 volts anymore in our parts. Um, okay. So. So keep in mind, we're talking digital multiplexers for purposes of this course, not analog multiplexers. But they, they do exist. OK. Now, uh, so these two control lines select one of these digital inputs to be connected to F. And if I is 1, F will be 1. If I is 0, F will be 0. If in the case of A equals 0, B equals 0. Now if we have A equals 0, B equals 1, now we're going to highlight I1, and it'll be connected to F, and I0 can change, and it won't make any difference in F, I2 can change, I3 can change, it doesn't matter, F only responds to the I1 input. 
And then if A is 1 and B is 0, now we're talking about I2. And then if A is 1 and B is 1, now we are talking about I3. So we s use our control lines to select which input is connected to F. All right? And F is either 0 or 1, depending on what its connected input is based on its control lines. And its control lines uh, have to be one of those four values, 0, 1, 2, or 3, in two bits. Okay? So keep that in mind. So when I say we select for I0, what that means is A equals 0, B equals 1. When I mean we select for I3, that means A equals 1, B equals 1, and so forth, and, every, and the two in between. All right, one of the things we can do with a multiplexer is uh, we, can, uh, we can use it to uh, send multiple conversations down the line, and I think I talk about this in the video. Uh, we can also implement any two-variable function, and I also go through that in the chapter video, but I, I'm, let me just do a couple of other examples in this case. So, uh, so let's say we have uh, a function. Let's say our function is f equals... Uh, and it's a let's say it's a three variable function three variables so it's a function of a b and c and it, let's say it equals the sum of the little m's and we're going to do maybe zero one three uh, six all right so how would we implement that with a um, multiplexer well the first thing we do is do a truth table so we do a b c and we do our output f We'll make this big enough. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Now we're going to divide it into pairs of rows. Now I'm going to plot these min terms. So I happen to know I have a one for zero a 1 for 1, not for 2, but a 1 for 3, so a 0 for 2, and then zeros for 4 and 5, and then a 1 for 6, and a 0 for 7. All right. Now, as it turns out, um, I just kind of fortuitously uh, happened to have had all these, uh, hit all the right values here. So notice, for every pair of rows, A and B are the same. So for this row, A is 0, B is 0. For this row, a is 0, B is 1. For this row, for both of these rows, for both of these rows, A is 1 and B is 0. And for both of these rows, A is 1, B is 1. So for each pair of rows, A and B are the same. And the only thing that changes is C. So what we do over here in our multiplexer, we're going to hook up to our two control lines, A and B. We're going to hook up our A and our B variables. And again, I could have given these different names, but the A would be the higher order and the B would be the next, the lower order. All right, now we have three inputs, or I'm sorry, four inputs, and our output F. And so this is I1, I2, uh, sorry, I0, I1, I2, and I3. And this first pair of rows, what input do, does A equals 0, B equals 0 for both of these rows select? Well, it, it selects I0. And this pair of rows, we're going to be, since A is... 0 and B is 1, we're going to be connecting I2 to F. I mean, sorry, I1 to F. And here will be I2, and finally I3. Okay. Now, what can we put into these inputs to generate F? Well, we've already talked about this. Hopefully you've watched the other video. So you know we have three possibilities. Both rows can have a desired output of F as 1. Both rows can have a desired output of F as 0. Both the rows can have 0 for the top row and 1 for the bottom row, or 1 for the top row and 0 for the bottom row. So how do we account for this? Well, if they're both 1, then we would just put a 1 in to I0. If they're both 0, we would just put a 0 in to that I2 in this case. If, if we have a uh, 0 for the top row and 1 for the bottom row, it turns out this exactly equals C for both rows, so we just put in C. But here, what do we do when we have, uh, where C is 0, we want F to be 1. Where C is 1, we want F to be 0. We put in C prime, the inverse of C. And so our four possibilities are 1, 0, C, or C prime. 
Now we don't necessarily use all of those in any problem, but in this problem, I just happened to pick it and we did. All right, let's do another problem uh, and we'll figure our inputs. So uh, we'll do ABC and we'll do F and we'll do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and we'll do zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, and we'll do zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. We'll do the pairs of rows. Now let's, we'll pick an arbitrary thing. Let's say now F, we'll call this F2, F2, we'll call this F1, F1, so let's two, say F2 equals the sum, and it's a three variable problem of the little m's. Say one, three, five, and six. Okay, well, so zero is a zero, one's a one, two's a zero, three's a one, five is a, so four is a zero, five is a one, and six is a one, and seven is a zero. So it turns out uh, this one follows C. So this this will be this will be i, so i zero is going to equal c, i one is going to equal c, i two is going to equal c, and i three is going to equal c prime. So we we didn't have any pair where the rows were both zero or the rows were both ones. So we wound up with c c c and c prime, and there's our multiplexer. Here's our four inputs. And this generates F. And we have to have A and B, the same A and B we have here. So if we called this cell, cell 1, that would have to equal A, and cell 0 would have to equal B. We'd have to connect them. All right, so you see how that works? All right, so I think we've done enough there. Now, what do we do for a four variable problem? For a four variable problem, it's really more the same. We, we just have a bigger truth table. Instead of eight rows, we have 16. So we have A, B, C, D, and we have our F. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, and then B, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. I'm sure that's obvious. That's a zero. And then zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. 0, 1, and 0, 1. Now we'll do the pairs. Pairs, pairs, pairs. Here we go. And then, so um, I didn't pick my function. Let me just, we'll just do this. Something like that. Okay, so here we have a multiplexer. So this is going to be I0. It has eight inputs. Um, and here we have I0, I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6, and I7. I0 is going to be equal to 1. I1 is going to be equal to 0. I2 is going to be equal to C prime. I3 is going to be equal to C. I4 is going to be C. I5 is going to be C prime. I6 is going to be 1, and I7 is going to be 0. And here's my multiplexer. There's my F out. And here are my inputs. Eight inputs. And I have how many control lines? One, two, three. We'll call these A, B, C. A is higher order, C is lower order. And we have to hook up A, B, C to my control lines. But what about D? We don't hook it up. Oh, sorry. I shouldn't have written this D prime. It's D prime, D, D, D prime. Got confused there, sorry. So our D only shows up on the inputs, not 
it's there's only three control lines and that takes up ABC all right I think that beats uh, multiplexers to death let me uh, let me now switch to uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, decoders decoders are really straightforward uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it um, and uh, I probably won't say too much uh, I think we cover these in the in the video pretty well but and they're pretty simple but here's and and really uh, uh, the classic decoders is, is the uh, 3 8 decoder and if you want bigger than that I, I, I guess they exist I but um, usually the 3 8 decoder is probably the one you might encounter the most but typically these days uh, what we really use decoders for mostly is de -deco to decode address lines into rows. Uh, and we see this in the ROM. Uh, so maybe I should talk about ROMs first and then we'll come back to decoders. Um, yeah, let's do that. That makes a little more sense. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so, okay, so, so let's say we have a ROM. So the thing, so what do I want you to know about ROMs? Okay, so, so read only memories. Now, first off, even though ROMs have the word memory in them, um, we actually, we actually, ROMs are combinational devices. And, and actually, combinational devices, we've said, or I've said, they don't have memory. So how does this make any sense? If a ROM for read-only memory is a combinational device that's not supposed to have any memory. How can a ROM have memory? All right, I'll, I'll give you. That's a bit confusing. Um, and here's the answer. It, it's 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 the distinction between a read-only memory and say a random access memory is that we can read and write the random access memory with the clock in real time. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we don't. We turns out we actually can do that with with EE proms and flash memory too, but for all intents and purposes, we don't, we don't think about it in those terms. We think about having written what we want to be in the ROM, in the ROM, and then we just, we're just going to leave it there, okay? So, oh, sorry, I guess you can't see me. So, so because we're going to do that, we, we write it in the ROM, we just leave it there. So we're not really in the business of, when we're using the ROM to, to implement a solution, we're not in the business of writing it dynamically and changing it. So, so that's why we think of it as a combinational device. But our ROMs have matured and gotten fancier, and, and now we definitely can write them and read them uh, in our circuits. And you see this used most frequently in microprocessors. With a microprocessor, we, we have a large ROM that we put the program in, but normally we just put the program in one time, and then we'll finish the product, ship it out to the field, and that program will be executed over and over and over again, never to be changed unless we do a field upgrade or something. Uh, so we're not really thinking about changing it. However, in many microprocessors, you will find uh, that there'll be some non-volatile memory in the form of an EEPROM that we can save some variables in. So when we power the chip down, those variables will still be there and, and we'll use them later. So there are times when we do use uh, a ROM as part of our memory elements. Uh, especially if we're interested in non-volatile stuff. All right, that may be confusing a little bit, uh, but we'll we'll talk about this some more. All right, okay. So so how do we so how do we define a ROM? Well, first off, we think of a ROM as as rows and columns. Okay, the rows tell us uh, uh, we have some number of rows in the ROM. And, and to address the rows, we have some number of address lines. Now we normally have uh, n address lines, so we're going to have 2 to the n rows. And if we have m columns, then, then our ROM will consist of 2 to the n rows of m columns. And we think of the number of columns, m, as our word size. And usually it's either 1, 4, 8, 16. It's usually a power of 2, but it doesn't have to be. 
our n it define, determines how many rows we have and how many address lines it takes to address those rows. And so normally the way the ROM is put together, we have the address lines will go into a decode, a decoder module, and the decoder module will have, if we have n address lines, we'll have 2 to the n uh, uh, row, row, uh, row lines. What happens is when you put the address in, one of these row lines will light up and be a 1, all the rest will be a 0. And they'll connect over here to our, to our storage area where we put our data and say, let's say we have, uh, let's say we have four columns. So in this case, m equals 4. And of course, I didn't say what n equaled. We'll just leave that imaginary. But we have some number of, some number of rows. And we'll have data in the form of ones and zeros stored in these. And when you light up, when you light up one of the rows, then that data for that row, let's say we light up this row, that data comes out and we output zero, one, one, zero for this row, say. For this row, if the first, well, I guess, for this, for this, if we lit up, say, this row, we would get out one zero zero zero, say. If we lit up this bottom row, we get out one 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 zero. So, so we output the word the word size, and we put in the address. We also have enables, so we can try state these outputs. Uh, which means we can disconnect the ROM from a bus. And if we disconnect it, then sometimes we'll use the uh, bus to actually input data into ROM and store the data in there, if it's, especially if it's an electrically erasable, electrically programmable read-only memory. And I go through the different types of ROM in the video, uh, in the book video. Okay, so, uh, so, that's, so this decoder, in this case, would be, a, uh, would be an N to 2n decoder. Now, um, back in the day of microcomputers, we had, uh, I used a lot of 74 um, LS 173s, I think that was the number, and, and those, those were the uh, three line to eight, eight line decoder. And I used those to decode my address lines, and usually you'd have to daisy chain a bunch of them together if you had, you know, you'd have to sort of daisy chain them to decode. If you, if you only had three address lines, then you could get by with one. But a lot of times you might have seven or eight or ten address lines. And so in that case, they, you needed a bunch of these things to make this work. All right. Uh, this, is the this is the device we'll talk about. So we'll, we'll look at a three to eight decoder. All right. So what is a three to eight decoder? Well, you have you have three address lines, we'll say, um, and a lot of times the address lines are A2, A3, A3, A3 uh, A1, sorry, uh, A2, A1, and A0, and our outputs are, there are eight outputs, and they're Y0 to Y7. And then you do have what's called a chip enable here, usually active low. And what happens is, uh, Whenever, if the chip is enabled, whatever the address lines have on them will light up that output. So if we put in three zeros, there'd be a one on Y zero and all the rest would be zeros. If we had say one, zero, one, then Y five would light up and it'd have a one and all the rest would be zeros. And then if you wanted to actually use this as a demultiplexer, then you would, then you would put your data into the chip enable and you can decide which output it goes out of with your address lines. And if you do that, that's when you can have, you would, you would set up a little system where you'd have, say, say a multiplexer, uh, you'd have, uh, you'd have a uh, uh, eight to one multiplexer. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines in, you'd have one line out, and you'd have three control lines. 
and then you'd send this over to your decoder. This would go into the chip enable. Your three address lines would, would connect up here in correct hierarchical order. And then here would be your outputs, your, your Y0 through Y7. So when you had I0 and I7, when you wanted to connect I0 to Y0, then you would put 0, 0, 0 on your three control lines. And then the, uh, the data coming out here, so if you put in, say, a 1 and then a 0 and then a 1, you get a 1 and a 0 and a 1 coming out here. Uh, and so you'd, you'd enable the chip, or you'd, let's say it's uh, active high, in this case, the chip enable. So you get a 1, and then a 0, and then a 1. So the Y0 then would put out 1, 0, 1. And uh, you can, what you can do is you can actually time slice these things. So you can, if you control the bandwidth on these inputs sufficiently, then you can actually have uh, all eight lines working in what appears to be simultaneously, but in fact, you're giving, say, each one gets one eighth of, say, uh, you have a uh, 10 kilohertz clock or something like that. Uh, so, so it gets one, one eighth of the, of, 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 uh, uh, of a, a one ten thousandth of a second. So, uh, and you just cycle through it very quickly, and that allows you to have a bandwidth uh, for any, any one of the lines uh, divide 8 by 10, so, uh, you know, maybe a, a 1 point something, 1.2 kilohertz bandwidth. So maybe you'd need a little faster clock speed to get a little better uh, throughput. But for voice, you only need about something like uh, 3K to 4K bandwidth. So if you ran this at, you know, say, say, uh, well, I don't know, say, say 20 kilohertz, that would give you, what, about a or maybe 24 kilohertz, that'll give you about a four kilohertz bandwidth for each of your eight channels. All right, so anyway, so that's how we would use it to actually for, for multiplexer, demultiplexer operations. But a lot of times we don't use them for that. We, we, we use them for just controlling our digital signals within, uh, say, uh, say, a microprocessor or an FPGA or whatever. All right, um, so how can we take a three to eight decoder and implement any uh, three variable logic function. Okay, so, so how do we do that? Well, I'll show you. So let's say we have a function f of a, b, c equals the sum of the min terms. And in this case, let's do zero, one, three, seven. Okay, so here's our, here's our decoder. In this case, we have a chip enable, uh, and we'll, we'll say it's active high, so we'll tie it up to VDD. We have our three inputs, um, A2, A1, and A0, and here's our truth table. Uh, well, I'm not gonna draw out the truth table, but we have, say, A, B, C, and then we have F, and so F is like, um, it's so 1, 1, 0, 1, and then uh, 4, 5, 6, and 1 for 7, okay? And then this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. All right, so, so these are the min terms, 0, 1, 3, 7. And here are our outputs, 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six, seven, eight. So y zero to y seven, y six, y five, y four, y three, y two, y one. So all you have to do is add one more gate. We'll take an OR gate. It has to have enough inputs. Here's our output F, and we're going to connect up min terms zero, one, three, and seven. Well, this generates all the min terms automatically. So we just connect up the min terms, 0, 1, 3, and 7, and presto, we've now generated F. And so that's how that works. Okay, so that's the example of the multiplexer. Now, uh, with the ROM, it's pretty simple. 
And I'll, I'm just going to show this quick example, and then we'll, we'll maybe talk about it a little bit more. But let's say we have a, a three-variable problem. We have a truth table. And let me go back to maybe, let's just use this truth table here, the one we just did. Okay. So I'm just going to use this one. I have these values for f. Now in this case, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, let's say we have several functions. Okay, this is f, we have f0, f1, and f2. So we have three functions. So maybe I'll make this 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and this is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and maybe I'll do f3, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. All right, how do we implement this with a ROM? Well, very simply. So here's our ROM. We have, we have uh, our, our storage area, and in this case, it's going to have four columns. And we usually call, and so the outputs will be the output uh, uh, 0, output 1, output 2, and output 3. And we're going to set those equal to F0, F1, F2, and F3. All right? And then we have our address decoder here. And we have three lines coming in, ABC. So we'll connect our ABC here directly to those address lines. And then they get decoded into one, well, so eight rows, one, they get decoded into eight rows, so our eight outputs. Uh, y0 to y7 and they light up we go ahead so whenever you address anything so if you have abc equal to one you'd light up this one and now all we do is we take the data here and we just map it directly into here so i would go one zero 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 which is my first row one 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 zero my next row zero one one zero my next row one Zero, zero, 001 that row and then 0111 0101 0011 and 1110 so whenever i put in abc uh, my four functions are going to come out exactly what i put in here which is what i wanted because that's what my truth table says so the rom just maps we just store the truth table in the rom that's how that works so you can see, would there be any point in trying to reduce that truth table in, if you're going to use the ROM? No, there's no point at all. Now, if, if the ROMs are more expensive, if you could reduce it and get it down to a few gates, that would be cheaper than a ROM. So you would, you'd probably want to do that in some cases. But in other cases, you already have the hardware you're going to use picked out. Okay, so, uh, so, so that pretty well covers what I wanted to cover in this video. Um, so we've now looked at uh, we've now looked at uh, multiplexers, uh, decoders, and read-only memories. And like I said, I wasn't going to say a lot about the address because I went over that pretty pretty much in the book video, uh, and we did that on the last test. Uh, you should look at the adder. Uh, it is really interesting. Um, maybe I'll do the uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find the. the Oh, I think we did. Oh, we lost it. Yeah, let me get this back. So, okay. So if we go down and look at the adder, which is stuck down here someplace. Um, oh, and and the video talks about this. This is a picture of a of a of one. So these are the types of ROMs. There's a whole bunch. We started off with ROMs that we would factory program. That's what we had in the early days. And then uh, then we got the ability to. Uh, uh, well, initially, you just had to manufacture it with the data inside. Then they would manufacture a blank ROM, and they'd blow it, but again, at the, at the factory, because it took some pretty, pretty fancy programmers to do it. And, and then later on, they got it a little simpler, so you could have your own programmer. You could buy a ROM that wasn't programmed. You could program it uh, at, at your facility. And then typically, though, once you programmed it, you were done. And then they uh, used floating gates, and they could electrically program them, uh, 
and they could uh, erase them with ultraviolet. And that's where we use these little windows. We'd shine ultraviolet light in here, and it would it would uh, enable the charge on our floating gates to leak off because of the ultraviolet light uh, kind of ionizes or creates a pathway for charges to flow. And uh, and so 15 minutes exposed to an ultraviolet light would erase it. And then you put a little sticker over it so it won't be erased once you reprogram it. And then you put it in a programmer and you program a new. Uh, new information into it. We use these ROMs uh, all the time as the boot ROMs in most computers. Desktops, laptops, uh, all have boot ROMs in them still to this day. Uh, but in the old days we had these ones with Windows. You could actually take them out. You could reprogram them if you had a programmer. Or you could buy new ROMs and upgrade your BIOS that way. Uh, nowadays they're programmable. Uh, electrically erasable, electrically programmable. And that was the next one. Uh, electrically erasable, electrically programmable, and then flash is also electrically erasable, electrically programmable, but you have to erase it in groups of cells, not just single cells like an EE prom. Uh, and so we've kind of gotten away from uh, the ultraviolet erasing, but it was kind of cool. I built my own ultraviolet eraser and my own programmer. Um, you had to have a little, you know, 20 millisecond, uh, 21 volt pulse to do the programming once you presented the data and the address. Um, Anyway, uh, so it was kind of fun. Uh, all right, now um, let me talk, go to the adder. I just wanted to touch base on this real quick. Um, yeah, so so re, so these so we have a one bit half adder where you have an A and a B and you get a, a, a sum and a carry out, or you can have a one bit full adder where you have an A, a B, and a carry in, and you get a sum and a carry out. And uh, here here is the truth table. So uh, we have A, B, and the, uh, this is the half adder. Uh, so A, B, a carry out in the sum, okay? And then this is for the full one bit adder. So we have A, B, and a carry in, a carry out, and a sum. Now, if you look at this, uh, if you look at these outputs and you do the K maps for them, look at these K maps. The K map for the sum, you, there's no, uh, there's actually another one here you have to loop. Notice, None of these ones can be combined with any other one. So you have one, I, for some reason I didn't put a circle around this one. You have one, two, three, four, three variable terms to implement this. It couldn't be worse. There's no simplification. And here you have one, two, three, two variable terms, which is pretty bad too. You, you know, if, if, um, if the good Lord had only allowed us to have maybe a group of four, our adders would be so much faster and simpler. But that didn't happen. Addition is actually hard, turns out. And uh, because of this, this drives so much of our digital logic, you wouldn't believe, because all math is essentially adders. And uh, the fact that these equations are complicated and not, not simple and don't simplify is really, it, it, it has a big impact. All right, uh, so I wanted to point that out. And there's a lot of ways of doing this. These are the final equations. Note there are four terms for the sum, one for each of these ones. And again, I left out the circle here. And three terms, three two-variable terms for the carry out. And you can do it, you can do it with, a, with an exclusive OR gate. There's a lot of ways of implementing. This is one example here. Uh, it does have an exclusive OR gate here and here. You don't have to use exclusive OR gates. You can do it in a two-layer and or, a two-layer or and, or nan nan, or nor nor. But this is how oftentimes they do it for various reasons, which I'm not going to go into here. And uh, and all we do is uh, we can daisy chain these together to get a to get a, a ripple carry adder, or we can we can build them in in sort of an array, uh, and we can get a uh, a carry look ahead adder. And we'll. We won't necessarily talk about that in this course. That's more of an advanced topic for digital systems design. Okay, just wanted to throw that in. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to stop with that. Um, hopefully, hopefully this uh, this helps you get a handle on these combinational devices. These are very important devices. They show up in all sorts of hardware. Our our big Field programmable gate array chips are made up of these components. Uh, that's how we, that's how we can program them, um, and that's how we can implement practically any hardware with just, uh, just uh, a ROM. If we have just a single output on a ROM, we call it a lookup table or a LUT. And uh, the chip we use in DSD is a uh, is a Vertex Seven series chip, 
and it has LUT sixes. It, it has two LUT sixes in every slice, and it's got a whole bunch of slices in every logic element. It's got two slices in every logic element, and it's got um, I don't know, 100,000 slices or something. It's got a lot. Maybe it's not quite that many, but it's a bunch. And basically, we just write the truth table into these LUT sixes, six variable lookup tables with one output. So they're really just ROMs. All right, th I'm going to stop with that. Uh, I did want to say one other thing. I will uh, try and get posted tomorrow on Saturday uh, the information uh, for your project. Uh, for this course, I, I think everybody's in a group, and the groups, I think uh, I've notified everybody. If you have any questions about your group, you can email me. I'll try and read my email tomorrow uh, and make sure I stay up with it over the weekend. Um, and uh, so you should be able, if you want to meet with your group uh, this weekend or Monday, uh, I will give you instructions. Let me just show you where that's going to be. Uh, I'll do that real quick here. Let's see. I want to bring this up, and I want to do, um, hang on. Okay, here's what the, uh, the currently the document uh, on Blackboard for you guys is, is not this. I have to fix this on, on Saturday. Uh, and there's a couple of things I'm going to do. So this document, what I want to do, let me blow it up a little bit so you can see it well. Okay, so uh, I went through this on class on Wednesday for the students that were there. But um, uh, so here's, here are the, these are the PowerPoint slides I want in your presentation. But the first thing I want you to do is, do a, is to do a truth table. And you're going to do six digits. And I'm going to give you six digits in your assignment. And you, you have to make them like this show. So this, this, is, this is just 16, 16 segment display. It has segments 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 across the middle, 11, 12 vertical, and then diagonal 13, 14, 15, 16. And there's a 17th decimal point. We're, not gonna, we're gonna completely ignore the decimal point. So you just have these 16 segments to deal with. And, um, okay. and you have six digits, so you can use this little worksheet. But I do have another worksheet I'll show you in a second that, I, that I'll also I'm going to put all this in your project folder, and you can get to this. And then down here, so what you do is, let's say, you, let's say your, your assignment is, uh, let's say your assignment is number one here. So let's say number one. Display the capital letters A, B, C, D, E using 17 segment hex display with three inputs, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, sorry, with the three inputs. And the three inputs will be, they'll be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 0, 0. That's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in binary. And for 0, you display A. When you put in 1, you display B, 2, C, 3, D, 4, E. And then for 5, 6, 7, you have don't cares which will help you simplify your, your, your k-maps. And you'll have three variable k-maps. All right, so you, you work out all the, all, the, all, the, all the segments you have to do for A, B, C, D, E, and then you can put that in your truth table. And then when you're all done, in this case, you're gonna have to get the POS solution and switch it to NOR NOR form. And then you're gonna have to uh, try and share as many gates as you can minimize your circuit as much as you can, and then put it into, say, Logisim Simulator or any logic simulator you want to use. But I suggest you download Logisim. Just Google it up, Logisim, L-O-G-I-S-I-M, and you'll find it. And I have made for you a, a hex display that goes into Logisim. And I will, uh, I, I showed that on Wednesday. Uh, I probably won't put it here now, but I will later. But let me show you the, the other. So here's another list of the steps you should do to do this. You know, read the problem carefully and then color in the templates for the, for the letters you're going to do. Develop the truth table. And that's where I want you to get to by, say, Wednesday or Friday of next week. I'll probably give you until Friday. All right, let me show you the other document real quick. Uh, so I, this is the worksheet. Now, I, I give you more. You only need five of these. So you've got But if you mess one up, you can use the bottom row. And, and then this is what your truth table should look like. Oh, sorry, I have to modify this. Uh, you only have variables A, B, C, not D, and you only need eight rows, not 16. Uh, but you do need these 16 columns, so I'll modify that. I'll fix this so it's correct. And what you do is you color in your assigned uh, characters, and then you, you figure. So if, like segments one is, has to be lit for the first one, so that, let's say for the first one it's an A. 
So that would be segments one, two, three, four, not the bottom two, uh, which would be five, six, but seven, eight, and then the crossbar, nine, ten. So one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you put a one, two, three, four, zero, zero, uh, then one, 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 and then zero, 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 zero. And you do that for B and C and D and E, and, and then you're done. And then you have three don't cares. And then you make a K map, a three variable K map for F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, all the way through F16. Now, some of these are going to be all ones or all zeros. In that case, uh, you, you, there's, it's an easy solution. It's the constant one of the constant zero. But some of them are going to require a circuit to implement. And then you want to look at those and see where these K maps have some overlap and you can share terms. All right. So that's how we're going to do this. And uh, I'll fix all these up. I'll have these in your uh, project folder, uh, hopefully by tomorrow night. And you can start work on it. Uh, hopefully, say, hopefully I'll get it done by 5 p.m. And you can start work on it tomorrow evening if you want. All right. That is, uh, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, so let me, uh, so just finish with, so, uh, so I do want you to work on this project. You pretty much almost have all the tools you need now. So, um, so we'll turn you loose and, uh, I think you'll find that you'll learn a lot doing this project. Uh, every student I've ever had has said the, the best part of the course was the final project. All right. With that, I'm going to sign off. We'll talk to you later. Bye.